Thank you, Chris. Um, and thank you, everybody, for taking the time out to come and listen to what we think is a very interesting piece of work. Um, I just wanted to start, though, by thinking about some of the wider issues, because wherever I go and whenever I start talking about these issues and assistive technology and the way that it could help, people ask me the questions. They ask why we th we're interested in assistive technology. Do we actually think it's going to make a difference for people with long-term chronic illness and why we think this is going to give efficiency gains or even um, better outcomes for people. So I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes just thinking through that uh, and giving some of the, the background. We know, for example, in England that there are just over 15, probably a bit more, 15 million people living with at least one long-term condition. We also know that though that number is going to increase, particularly those with multiple conditions. So we can see that the issues and the needs of people with those health conditions is going to grow. But more importantly that, in England, we know that around 50% of all of our GP appointments are people with chronic illnesses. We also know that they use about 70% of all the inpatient beds. So at any one day, in any of our uh, inpatient beds, the, about 70% of the population in those beds will have at least one long-term condition. We also know that they use about 65% of all the outpatient appointments. So you can see that they are very high users, and I'm sure that's the same around the world. But in England, we have estimated that that accounts for about 70% of the total health and social care spend, which is a sizable amount of money when you think about the total budget that we, we're working with. So if we could reduce the number of unplanned admissions, those people who pass possibly um, get through the system and into one of those inpatient beds when maybe there was an alternative. We could be looking at better outcomes, we could be looking at people being more independent for longer, we could find people being happier. Um, certainly when I speak to patients, and I'm sure it's the same for everyone else, <coughs> most people say, I don't really want to be in hospital unless I really, really need to be in hospital. If I can have that care elsewhere, that's what I would prefer. So we know that's what they want. And we have an approach to manage long-term chronic illness. So long-term conditions uh, in England, we look at that in terms of any health condition, particularly health conditions, that can't be cured but can be managed. They can be managed through some therapy or medication or a combination. So it's something that people are going to live with for the rest of their lives. And we know that if you can target your population by risk assessment, so you know who those people are going to be, you can start to put in place um, support on an intensive one-to-one -one basis for some people. You can have personalised care planning for people where they start to have a, a proper engagement with their health professionals about the care they want. And we can start to support people better to make the decisions for themselves through supported self-care. And I know this works, I've seen it work, I've, I've seen how it transforms people's lives, I've seen the feedback at local level. People feel far more empowered, they feel as though they can actually make those decisions for themselves. They feel that by having that support, then for the thousands of hours that they have during the year, then where they're, they're actually not with a health professional, then they actually are able to make informed, appropriate decisions about uh, medication, about therapies, about just the everyday things that some of us take for granted. And all of that helps to uh, ensure their health status remains uh, often stable and therefore re uh, removed from the need to go to a hospital. And I think that's where telehealth and telecare, the assistive technologies that we've been looking at, can really make a difference. And when we talk about telehealth and telecare in the whole system demonstrator program, we talk about telehealth being um, that remote monitoring of health vital signs, for example, and telecare is about the support to people so that they stay uh, independent and have independent living for longer. So that's what we mean by that. Um, it helps people de deliver a service around their needs, whatever they may be, and helping staff to target the resources more appropriately. That's the aim, and that's what we've been hoping to do. The whole system demonstrator program, um, as Chris was, was mentioning, is a very complex uh, program, very complex trial. It took a lot of work to just uh, set it up, and, and Tim will uh, give you some more of the background on that. But as, as far as we know, this is the largest randomized controlled trial of 
this technology anywhere in the world. We've got over 6,000 people, uh, and that includes around about 400 or so uh, carers. We've got 238 GP practices involved, and uh, we're working across three sites, and you'll hear more about the sites today. In fact, I think there is a, a visit to one of them as well. But the sites were in Newham, in London, Kent and Cornwall, and they were deliberately uh, selected after the uh, rigorous uh, application process, which Tim will remember well, um, because it gives a good spread across um, urban, rural and inner city. The evaluation uh, has involved uh, leading researchers from a number of universities across uh, the UK. So we've had um, Imperial, we've had UCL, LSE, we've had Oxford, Manchester uh, and the Nuffield and King's Fund involved as well. That evaluation, as Chris said, is being uh, led by uh, Professor Stan Newman on my left here. And that evaluation is broad-based so that the impact of these devices uh, could be evaluated at an economic level as well as in relation to the effect on patients, carers and staff. So we wanted to deliberately identify how this works, not just for uh, the people who are using it, but what the effect is on the whole system as well. We sought views from professionals, patients and informal caregivers. So it's important to remember that the carers element in the study will be, I think, quite a, an illuminating area as well. And it was designed to be robust and rigorous with rigorous assessment because we wanted to be as pragmatic as possible. In essence, though, it's really involved three randomised controlled trials. So whilst it is one whole trial itself, there are three uh, pieces of work going on there. The first of these is examined telehealth across three specific conditions. And we didn't just want to look at one condition for a um, very good reason that it is the multiple issues. So we started looking at heart failure, diabetes and COPD. The second study within the larger study has examined telecare excuse me, on um, uh, people who are in receipt of social services, for example. So can telecare help people to remain uh, independent and have that independent quality of life for longer? And then the third involved the impact of these devices on carers. As I say, it's about looking at the whole system and it's looking at the whole piece. So how does it affect people? What we know, though, is, and I'm sure you know, many in this room will have the same um, knowledge as I have, but telehealth and telecare is littered with small studies, with small services and small numbers. Lots of these um, studies and, indeed, the services are delivering fantastic results and are showing great promise. But the issue is, can they be translated into large scale? And when, when I'm saying small, I've seen them as small as you know, 15 or 20 people. So... It, it is important to see if we can get that, that scale. And that's what we try to do with WSD. We were determined to overcome that issue of, of small scale and get that um, robust evidence base. Of the actual patients involved in the study, half were randomly allocated to receive a device. So we would put them into that sector where they're actually getting um, an installation and half into, uh, into the control group. And it did, out of the numbers, it did work out about 50-50. Across all three sites, it was about 50-50, a little bit more and less in, in some, but it worked out about, about there. And we did the same with the carers as well. They were allocated either to a group where the, 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 the condition group that they cared for, the person they cared for, or they were put into the, the control group. The detailed findings of this study, obviously, are going to, I think, help decision makers, not only in England, but across um, a lot of systems across the world, um, make the decisions about how to apply these technologies and how you get your uh, return on investment. People are waiting for the evidence. I know that, and I know that's what you're all sat there waiting for me to tell you. you know, you're hoping I'm going to put up a slide which shows you the, the return on investment and the uh, percentages of the change. Unfortunately, I'm not able to do that today. Um, we always knew there was going to be pressure to get the results out quickly, uh, and, but I'm sure you can understand the need for uh, caution to make sure that the findings are robust. The evaluation team only received the final um, set of data in January this, week, this year, so six, seven weeks ago. But we now have at least 12 months 
data of use of everybody in the study. Some people have been on it obviously for longer than 12 months, but uh, some uh, uh, just under, uh, just over 12 months. And again, the reason for that is the recruitment of patients under the study was over a period of time and actually proved to be very problematic. Probably, um, I think it's fair to say, a lot more difficult than anybody involved in the study at first thought was going to be the case. But to get that large number, I think, was a, was a sterling effort by everybody in the three sites. And there's um, a wealth of data that we just now need to, to work through. Obviously, we need to conduct careful analysis, and you wouldn't want me to, um, and I'm sure Stan would, uh, would be very upset if I were to, to jump the gun and start giving some of those numbers out. But I can give you some indications of the early findings that the evaluation team have put together. I think really the, the, the message to say is that the findings are very encouraging. As you might expect um, with this complex approach, it has been probably a little bit more difficult to pin down exactly what we think is happening early. But we do start to see some encouraging signs. For example, there is an indication of a reduction in emergency hospital admissions for some people, particularly those people with COPD. We're starting to see that, that trend. The issue, though, is whether that can be sustained over a period of time. And obviously that's the question that the evaluation team are now looking at, delving into the, the, um, the depths of all of the data to look at whether this can be sustainable. But we are seeing that, that trend of reduction. Overall, in telehealth, the cost-effectiveness analysis that indicates that there's a trend towards an improvement. But what we're also noticing is that when this study started, um, given the high cost base, a lot of the equipment is, is still at a high level, we need to be careful to understand the relationship between that high cost initial startup, if you like, in terms of where we are currently at, and the return. And essentially, if you can get that cost base down in terms of the unit price, the return is likely to be, be greater. So we just need, again, to be careful about how we understand that and what the issues are around that. But essentially, let's say the, the early findings are um, promising, we're seeing reductions, and we're seeing the opportunity for cost saving and return on investment. But let's, let's just get the, the full results together. I think, though, the key to all of this is how to make the use of assistive technology something which is a substitutional approach, not an additional one. So you're not buying the equipment and putting it into the system uh, and expecting miracles. What you need to be looking at is how you transform the service, how you actually change the way that you deliver care for people uh, with these chronic long-term conditions, and at the same time start to introduce the technology as a means of supporting that self-care agenda and the flow of information. What we're seeing is that the data also suggests that assistive technology can maintain quality of life and the psychological well-being of individuals. Um, that is in itself an important finding. We're seeing that people are, uh, are able to uh, have that uh, quality of life maintained. It's certainly not dipping, but again, we just need to see uh, whether that is sustainable over the longer period. I actually think, though, that what it's saying to me is it's confirming something that I uh, believe I've had for a long time, that if you're going to achieve any of these possible benefits through introductions of transformed services, use of technology, you need to understand the population that you serve. You need to have that risk uh, stratification, risk analysis. You need to know who the people are that you can target. It's no point introducing it to everybody over a certain age, for example. Not everybody is going to always benefit. In my view, it is about service first and then kit second. It isn't about, let's just go and buy some of this wonderful technology that's out there, and there's lots of it, and it's improving and developing as we, as we speak, and then giving it to people and thinking you're going to get a change. It's not. It's about how you can develop a new service with the support of the, uh, the uh, um, technology. The evaluation is now turning to the important question of understanding who it works for, in what circumstances, and with which devices and under what circumstances. So let's get to the real nitty-gritty now. 
Uh, time scale wise we're expecting probably again from uh, late spring onwards we'll start to see some of that emerging. Whether we can um, promise that it's going to be um, robust enough for full publication, I'm sure Stan can uh, tell, tell me later. So going back to the beginning, why were we interested in assistive technology? Well, I think it's because it has a place in the delivery of better care for people with long-term conditions and chronic illnesses. And I think the whole system demonstrator program, which, as I said at the beginning, has been um, both a joy and a... Um, a trial in many ways in terms of getting it up and running, I think it will establish that solid evidence base that everybody's looking for. So bear with us, we will get there. Um, Stan and Tim um, are going to be giving you more details on the trial, how it was uh, approached, how it was put together, what the issues are. And I'm sure you, they'll be happy to um, engage in conversation and discussion about that. But um, that's all from me and I'm happy to take any questions uh, at this stage. Thanks very much. Uh, it's been a very clear, comprehensive, context-setting presentation. Uh, it's mainly where the whole system demonstrator program fits in. We will move on fairly quickly to Tim and Stan, but are there any immediate points anybody would like to raise by way of clarification? Uh, ben, down the front, please, first of all, and then a gentleman over here. We'll take two or three points, and you can come back to Stephen if there are other issues uh, in our final Q&A. Uh, please say who you are. stayed on the, uh, the equipment. Um, who funded the study? That was the Department of Health in England. And it'll be, when it's all completed, a total investment of about £31 million. Um, the amount of time, I'm not sure if Stan or Tim can answer that one. I don't have that information. I wouldn't want to give you a, a mean but I certainly think we've got people who've been on it for a significant amount of time. And when I talk about the data, I'll tell you how we will examine length of time in relation to outcome. Okay, thank you. And, and the 31 million is the cost of the uh, three areas for their involvement plus the cost of the evaluation? It is, yes. That's the total cost. Total cost. So, and there's a gentleman here, please. I just wanted to, oh, sorry, David Hogarth, Westminster Local Involvement Network. I just wanted to know, that, to be sure that dementia is included as one of the conditions. Uh, as long-term conditions. Secondly, when we might expect the final results. Yeah. Um, dementia is seen as a long-term condition in terms of the strategy and the way that we're promoting the approach. It wasn't one of the areas specifically included in the whole system demonstrator program, but having said that, this approach will support people uh, with dementia as well as uh, any other condition, I'm, I'm sure of it. Timing-wise, I think the um, I'm looking across to Stan because he's probably being very nervous at this moment. I, I think we're probably looking at, um, I say, May, June, something like that. Perhaps I can expand on that. Um, <clears throat> there are real questions about, as you say, when will, quotes, the results be out. There are a range of different results that will come out over a period of time over the next six to nine months. And we're hoping to prioritize the key elements of that approach, of the findings, rather than suggesting that the whole final report will be out in the next few months. It really requires us to target the key questions and those key outcomes and to write those up. And those, we hope, will be coming out in the next couple of months in a formal way in a public forum. Okay, thanks. And let me take two more questions there in the middle. We'll move on to Tim and Stan then. Yep. No, okay, now it is. Okay, great. It's a very short question, anyhow, I could have shouted it. I was just wondering what the share of intervention cost was as part of the total cost. What do you mean by that? Uh, I, intervention versus evaluation. So, well, okay, so... I the delivery of care and kit and all yep. these kind of nursing time, all these kinds of things. It just roughly. 
I'd have to look to my colleagues here. Do we have that it was, it was all, Most of it was on the intervention side, wasn't it? The evaluation proportion was a small element of the total £31 million yeah, there, there that was, was spoken of. There was, um, there was investment in, obviously, the equipment that needed to be used. There was investment in supporting the site in terms of establishing, managing, doing the programme management. Um, there was costs of service delivery as well. But... Um, I, I haven't got the numbers and the breakdown in front of me, but we do have that in the programme. Right, Stan? If you want to ask me that outside uh, step, we sure, can get that no, that's fine. Thanks, Stephen. I can certainly let you know that approximately 12 to 15 per cent of the overall cost is that going to the evaluation. So it, it's not an inexpensive evaluation, as you will gather, but I think going back to what Stephen was saying earlier on, Given that a lot of the studies that have been published so far are very small scale, the designs are not fantastic. This was deliberately set up to like, fill that gap with a very rigorous uh, controlled design uh, with a number of different teams bringing together different expertise which we'll hear more about. And we know as researchers that studies like that do not come cheap, hence the level of cost. Final question, please. Yes, uh, my question is, uh, as I understand, the, um, you are going to compare the costs with support of technology against the traditional way of providing uh, support. Yeah. But you are taking in consideration that um, the cost of not having uh, no care because there are no medical staff enough to provide um, uh, support for some people. So, uh, for example, I know that in physiotherapy for uh, earth stroke, there are only 50% of the people that are receiving any kind of support. Okay. Are you considering the cost of the other 50% that are not receiving no okay. care? I think that's a good segue, isn't it, into yes. what we will be talking about. Yes. Maybe at that point, that's an opportunity to ask Tim yes. and Stan to get into the detail of what's been going on. So, Tim Ellis, first of all, followed by Stan Newman. Uh, 